great. So uh, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of uh, Sarah Bennett, who's your real host, I'm just the moderator. <laughs> and, and Rob from R4D. And Rob from R4D, so surrounded by a great lineup here this morning. Um, we're so happy you all could join us for what I think is actually going to be a, a super interesting discussion. And I think all the more so because this is a relatively small group, so it means we can have lots of opportunity for engagement and, and conversation and, and back and forth. Um, uh, one of the reasons I was just so delighted when Rob and Sarah um, asked if I'd be willing to uh, help moderate the discussion today is because I think we're in such an interesting moment right now when we start to try to think about these questions around transition and sustainability. You know, on the sort of global stage, we have the financing for development meeting coming up in July, where a lot of the conversation, of course, will be on global health, is going to be about how we sort of take forward the sustainability agenda into development more broadly. Um, that will bring us into the whole discussion around the sustainability, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, the successor to the MDGs, and what that framework's going to look like and how we learn from the MDG experience and make sure that what we are now teeing up for the agenda for the next 15 years also is going to be owned well by countries and be sustainable over the longer term. Um, we also have the work just being done by a lot of the major bilateral donors, of course by PEPFAR, and we have great PEPFAR representation here today thinking about the longer term sustainability questions. And we've seen Gavi work on this for a long time, you know, now Global Fund's trying to think about it a little bit differently. Um, and certainly from the point of view of my own organization, and I probably should have introduced myself before I started, <laughs> my name is Lisa Cardi and I'm the director of the uh, UNA's office here in Washington, D.C. Um, but certainly from the point of view of my own organization, um, this is an issue that just is really at the top of the agenda. You know, And we've seen some very promising trends in the last couple of years. You know, For the first time, I think two or three years ago, we saw actually resources from the Global South starting to exceed donor resources in terms of flows and support for HIV, but it's, it's, it's still not at the margin that we, we would like to see. We need to work harder on that. A lot of that increase was driven by, um, by actions taken by South Africa and Brazil and, of course, India. And now we need to think about how we bring those same trends to um, some of the, the lower income and lower middle income countries. Um, so we have a terrific group this morning. We have um, four, three of the major institutions working in the global health and, uh, of course, um, a very significant government on the global health agenda that's going to be joining us. Um, I think what I might do is just briefly introduce each of our panelists, um, and then we'll do a quick, maybe round the table introduction so we know who's here with us. Um, so we're going to hear from four panelists uh, today. We're going to hear from Dr. Sarah Bennett, um, who is an associate uh, professor at the Department of International Health at the Bloomberg School, and has spent most of her professional career focused on issues around health system strengthening and transition, <coughs> and has done a special, at the request of the Gates Foundation, has done a special examination of the transition plans and structure and evolution of that within the Abahan program. Um, we're going to hear from Matangi Jairam, who is the senior program officer based in New Delhi with the Gates Foundation, working on Abahan. And Matangi has been with the Abahan program for about seven years and explicitly working on this issue around transition planning and has really brought it to the point where it is today. Um, and then from Rob Hecht as well, who I think is probably known to many of you. Rob, a managing director at Results for Development and long career previously at IAVI and the World Bank, also at UNAIDS. Um, so it'll be great to hear his perspectives more broadly on where the Abahan experience kind of fits into the broader transition agenda. Um, and then we're also going to have joining us by, by a video, by a video message, um, Dr. Niraj Dringa, who is the Deputy Director of NACO in India. And he had actually very much hoped to be with us here in person this morning, but because of a small health issue, he wasn't able um, to join us. Um, so before we jump into the main program, can I just suggest maybe that we simply go around and just a quick maybe name and institutional affiliation so everybody knows who everyone is. And maybe we'll start with the gentleman over here. Um, uh, my name's Andrew Waiter. I'm from Save the Children. Uh, Thayer Rosenberg, Results for Development. John McManus, Friends of the Global Fight. Shana Vidai, Friends of the Global Fight. You know, why don't we, let's, con let's continue around the, 
the, the window, okay? And then we'll go <laughs> back to the table, okay? So please, sir. Lee Fredman with Results for Development. I am Tess Rickman with Results for Development. Hi, I'm Catherine Patton with the CSIR School Health Policy Center. I'm Sarah Hapa and the Policy Project from Features Group. Debbie Cleo from USAID. Email is on it. Okay. I'm Billy Pick, also from okay. Trevor Rickmiller, also from okay. Stefan Grunman, PSI. Rachel Sullivan, Center for Global Development. And then Regan, why don't you pick up with you? Regan Hoffman, UNA. And then James Timberlake, Office of the Global Aid Coordinator. Mike Bruckner, OGAC. Thank you, Catherine Williams, Evidence Action. Jennifer Sherwood, AMPAR. Samira Rojarat, AMPAR. Uh, Howdy, William Gates, Fonders. Josh Michel with the Kaiser Family Foundation. Maria Larkin, International HIV AIDS Alliance. Jen Gates, Kaiser Family Foundation. Danielle Rodriguez, the Blooper School Book Town. Sorry about that. I've been introduced <laughs> already. <so. laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. Not that I'm a panelist. <laughs> it was an open seat. I'm Vera's leader with USAID Asia. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Um, so I've been asked just to say a word or two about housekeeping issues before we get started, often the most important issues. Um, so uh, please help yourself to coffee and refreshments throughout. Um, the gentleman's room is outside the door, and ladies is apparently upstairs on the next floor. Um, if you have not signed in, please do go ahead and sign in before you leave. Um, so I think what we'll do is we're going to start out um, with the presentations. And I think we're going to go to Matangi first, who's going to help set the broader context. And then we'll go directly to the video message from Dr. Um, Duringa, and then to Sarah, and then to Rob, to sort of bring it all together. Um, we'll probably just do quick clarifying questions after each presentation, um, but we hope to get through the presentations in sort of 45, not more than 50 minutes, and then have the balance of time um, for discussion in Q&A. Um, so with that, I think I will give the floor to Matangi. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I have a soft voice, so I hope folks there can hear what I'm saying. So thank you very much. I must thank uh, Sarah and Rob for jointly hosting this dissemination. And uh, right now, as we speak, we, we are in the third phase of Avahan. And uh, one of the goals for the program is to dis disseminate the lessons learned from the decade-long decade -long program in India. Right? So before we get into the nuts and bolts of the actual process of transition, which Sarah will allude to in her presentation, I thought it was important to set the context because one can't assume that all of you know about the Avahan program. So some of the initial slides may be stating the obvious. Uh, some of you might have heard about it. But I'll just breeze through some of the basic slides and spend more time talking about the second phase of the program, which focused on transition. Right. And like Lisa said, at the end of the presentation, if you have any clarifications, happy to answer them. Um, so Avahan was meant to be a 10-year program and broadly divided into two phases, right? So phase one was about scaling up the program. And the backdrop or the background to the Gates Foundation investment was a study done by CSIS uh, in, in the early 2000s. And at that time, it was projected that uh, approximately 20 to 25 million people would be living with HIV AIDS in India. Of course, that pr projection is incorrect right now because as we speak it's roughly around 2.5 million people living with HIV AIDS in India but that was the urgency right so even private foundations like the Gates Foundation invested something like 258 million uh, US dollars in the first phase of the program uh, so like I said phase one was about scaling up the response in India and phase two was about in a phased and gradual manner handing over the interventions to the government of India Right, so the key words here uh, is to look at that. The fact that transition planning was initiated as early as 2006, right, while we knew that you know, the program was winding up by 2013. Right. The other key word here for this particular discussion is that the actual transition got completed by 2012, and we spent another additional year providing what we call as the post-transition support to the government of India. Right, so these were the two initial phases, and frankly, we didn't visualize a third phase of Avahan. By 2013, it was meant to be a sunset program within the India country office. But um, what we felt as a, a small three-person team that's left of Avahan right now, 
is that while the transition to the government has been efficient and it's, it's something that's over and done with, um, but the transition to the next set of what we call the natural owners of the program, the communities, uh, we had started <coughs> working with them in the second phase of the program. Right? And that seemed like unfinished business. And it didn't seem like a responsible exit to say that, you know, that piece is over, over and done with. Right? And while we were you know, sort of thinking of winding down, uh, NACO came back to us and said that, you know, you really can't step off some of the critical areas of support that you have been extending to NACO. And I'll, I'll speak to that in my subsequent slides. So we went back to the leadership team within the foundation and said that we don't want new monies. So all the grantees who worked in the first two phases of Avahan, we looked at savings. And we look, looked at some of the underperforming grants, and we managed to repurpose a substantial amount of money for what is the current phase of Avahan. And right now, which is 2014 to 17, the focus is threefold. So the three broad objectives is, one, we continue to work with NACO uh, in supporting some of the key institutional mechanisms which ensures that the focus on the targeted interventions continues. Second is to work with the communities. If you ask me, that's the key focus for this phase. And the third is to, you know, it, it would be a pity really to not talk about what we have learned from the decade-long experience in India and not share it with, you know, a larger audience. It could be within India and outside India. So this is one of the part of the dissemination series that you're seeing. So. In terms of the actual uh, scale up, the design was to, obviously, I mean, in a country like India, it is a concentrated epidemic, unlike many of the African countries where it's mostly generalized with concentrated pockets. So it was very clear from the very beginning, based on the data available to us, that we had to work with the key populations, right? So it, the key populations meaning predominantly female sex workers <coughs> and uh, men who have sex with men and transgender population, people who inject drugs. So these were the three core groups. And in phase one of the program, we also worked with what we call as a bridge population, the migrants and truckers, and the clients of sex workers. And the other no-brainer, frankly, was to look at data to focus on the high prevalent states. So the foundation said that while the government of India focuses on the rest of the geographies, <coughs> Our investments will be catalytic in focusing on the six states which had the highest prevalence. And even today, despite you know, uh, significant declines in the um, HIV prevalence in the general population, these six states continue to be high burden states. Right. So I'm talking about the four southern states of Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and the two states in the northeast that you see highlighted in blue, uh, Manipur and Nagaland. Uh, in terms of the uh, transmission dynamics, it's predominantly sex work driven in the southern parts of the country, whereas in the northeastern <coughs> parts of the country, it's an IDU epidemic, right? So, you know, in uh, India, everything is about scale. So if you look at the numbers, we covered six states, 82 districts, 600 plus towns, and a combined state population of approximately 300 million, which is equal to the size of countries in, you know, many other places, many other continents, and uh, roughly 300,000 high-risk groups covered through our program. And those red lines that you see in the map is the truckers' routes, where we had truckers' interventions in phase one of the program. And those uh, <coughs> little red dots is where we had the male client program. Again, these programs didn't exist in phase two of the pro uh, phase two of Abahan. Um, the other approach in phase one was, I mean, obviously it was not something that we invented, right? So we looked at other large scale HIV prevention programs and looked at a proven package of interventions which worked elsewhere. But what was unique to Avahan was this a sort of an integrated approach which, which also looked at additional components beyond just commodity distribution and looking at the biomedical risk, which includes STI treatment, uh, you know, HIV testing, etc to also work on the enabling environment because ultimately you know HIV all of us know is also a social disease so to speak so unless you so address the underlying social determinants things like violence crisis and if you don't create an enabling environment especially in a country like India where it's quite in your face uh, 
uh, you can't actually even talk about things like quantum distribution, right? So in this whole thing, if you ask me one thing which has been a cornerstone and which is unique to Avahan, his whole concept of community mobilization, right? And which is why, I mean, the naysayers and skeptics say that, you know, once you start work, working with the communities, it's more than a decade long kind of investment. Uh, so should you have even looked at something like this? I would still say yes, because early on into the program, one realized that, you know, if you didn't work on violence reduction, a woman, a sex worker could not even carry a condom in her purse, right? So the cops would come and pick her up only, you know, she was standing in a bus stop soliciting sex work. She had a condom, condom in her bag and that became an issue and she would get arrested, right? So the initial two to three years, there was a lot of focus on violence reduction. So much so, you know, a lot of my colleagues, I didn't work in phase one of the program, maybe Hari can uh, talk to it, but uh, a lot of women used to believe that Avahan is a violence reduction program and not so much a HIV reduction program. Um, this is part of the, I mean, if you look at the overall Avahan design as part of the classic <coughs> DOES framework, design, operate, execute, sustain. So we spoke about the design elements. Um, I don't want to get into too many details. I can share, you know, a lot of literature around this, but just wanted to call out to as part of the execution uh, strategy. Um, it was meant to be a rapid and simultaneous scale up across all the 600 towns uh, that you saw in the map earlier. We didn't believe in a pilot project, say in a district or a sub-district level, <coughs> and depending on what we saw, scale it up. So we said that, you know, let's roll it out, right? So, but again, the challenges were that it was a large scale program. Uh, it was a very diverse kind of a setting that you were catering to, right? So a rural setting, say in Karnataka, the demands in the landscape is very different compared to you know, a brothel setting typically in large cities like Mumbai, Bangalore or Hyderabad or the Northeast is so difficult to operate in because geographically for people to travel from, you know, one place to another, even if it's like two kilometers, it's very difficult because it's a hilly terrain and a lot of sort of, what do you call, Maoist kind of activities happening there. So the initial days, even doing basic outreach in states like Nagaland, Manipur was a huge challenge, right? So. How did we overcome all that is by, these are some of the success factors, not all of it. One is obviously to look at data, right? So how do you optimize your resources, right? So where do you program even within a state, right? How do you pick districts which have the relatively higher prevalence and as, again, relatively higher population of sex workers, IDUs, MSMs, etc. cetera. Um, the second is to, I think this is very critical in the Avahan program is we came up with what we call as a common minimum program, right? So let me just give you an example. So the way the STI services were delivered, the guidelines were common across all the states, right? So while we had a CMP, a com common minimum program, we allowed for flexibility to cater to the local needs, right? So say for example, the guideline said that one peer educator from the community would ca cater to 60 other sex workers, right? Be it in terms of beh behavior change communication, distributing condoms, getting her to come to a STI clinic, etc. So one is to 60 works well in a city-based setting, right? But in a rural setting where a peer educator has to travel a lot, one is to 60 was not practically possible. So we said maybe it should be a 1 is to 35 or a 1 is to 40. So those were the kind of flexibilities that were built in early on in the program, um, which initially the government had a problem accepting because, you know, NACO tends to go by the rule book. But eventually, as the program evolved, today if you see this whole approach of a CMP with flexibility built in has also been adopted by NACO as part of the guidelines, right? Of course, I mean, it's a no-brainer that, you know, once you start engaging communities as agents, as frontline workers, you see a dramatic increase in the uptake of services, right? So initially, a lot of outreach was happening by non-community outreach workers also, right? So one of the learnings was that when you have to do a social network analysis and do an intelligent estimation of your denominator, the more you involve the community, 
and the more active role taken by the communities, like I said, condom uptake went up, right? More women started coming into the clinics. So this whole concept of peer education and engaging communities as peers was also part of the rapid and simultaneous scale up. And this is just a indicative chart to show you that the quick ramp up of both what we call as the soft and hard infrastructure. Hard infrastructure would be things like very quickly setting up the drop-in centers, safe spaces where women, women could come in and talk about issues that were of concern to them, right? Setting up of program-run clinics because one, the government uh, hospitals were not, you know, they were not sort of geared up to uh, look at STI services. And sex workers were not comfortable walking into a government center for STI treatment. So in the first phase of Avahan, we set up what we call as program-run clinics. Right? And that created a lot of comfort for the women to say that, you know, I know the doctor, there is no stigma and discrimination here. Right? So that's the hard infrastructure. Soft is, of course, the entire the human resources piece. Peer educators, outreach workers, uh, your um, nurses, doctors in the STI clinics, etc. Uh, that was phase one. Quickly jumping to the phase two of the program, if you remember, in the earlier slide, I had mentioned that the thinking around transition started way back in 2006, right? So transition was deliberately meant to be a gradual process. It, it was not like, you know, one fine day you hand over all the 170-odd interventions from Avahan to the government of India and walk away, right? So it was meant to be, like, if you see, these are the three broad areas where we worked in. So bulk of our investments was with the targeted intervention. <coughs> so we said that let's transition 10% in 2009. And we looked at interventions which were performing relatively better. Right? So these were in uh, states and districts where HIV prevalence was low. The NGOs were performing well. So that's the first 10%. And that was the most difficult and challenging piece, if you ask me. I think when Sarah talks about the actual transition evaluation, a lot of uh, feedback from the ground. Um, we got to hear that, you know, and even for us as program officers based in the states, working very closely with the state government, a lot of pain in terms of, you know, aligning our interventions with the government intervention, so on and so forth. But with each phase, I think we learned from our mistakes. And when the bulk of the interventions were handed over in 2012, I think it was very efficient because we had learned from the two other tranches of transition. And the others, the truckers' interventions were handed over in two phases, one in 2010, the other in 2011. And condom social marketing interventions, I mean, this by itself is a huge piece to talk about. Like I said, I'm not getting into the details. Um, the other piece of transition is to ensure that, you know, any donor-driven program, you have the flexibility of funding, uh, you have the freedom to run it the way you want it, right? But um, I remember the Deputy General, General for NACO, a lady called Sujata Rao, who used to head NACO during this time when we started talking about transition. She was very categorical, saying that I cannot afford to take on any donor-funded interventions because it's not completely aligned to mirror what the government-run interventions look like. So whether it was a BMGF-funded intervention or a USAID-funded intervention, roughly our costs were anywhere between 15 to 20 percent over and above what a government intervention looked like, right, in terms of budgets. So a large part of our time, when I say our time, it could be starting with program officers like me, working in the trenches with our grantees to the state AIDS control societies to the NGOs at a district level. I think collectively we spent a good three years actually aligning everything from budgets to what the staff structures look, look like in these interventions to even things like, you know, the data collection formats for your monitoring and evaluation, the monthly reporting that happens. Everything had to be aligned before we handed over the interventions to the government, right? So when I talk of alignment, it's across three levels. At a fundamental level at the base is the physical handing over of the interventions. So the 169 odd interventions managed by the NGOs and the community-based organizations funded by the Gates Foundation, aligned to look like the 1,200 NGOs and CBOs which were funded by the <coughs> government, the NACO-funded uh, interventions. 
At the next level is those nine state lead partners. What you see as SLPs are the immediate grantees, the Gates Foundation grantees. So across the six states, we had nine state lead partners. And they worked closely with their counterpart in the government, which is the State AIDS Control Society. So there was some amount of skill transfer that happened from our partners to their counterparts in the government. And of course, at the top is the entire policy advocacy done by the Gates Foundation team sitting in Delhi, including folks like Hari and others, who were literally day in and day out dealing with NACO. Right? So a large part of um, the guidelines which we see today, the guidelines for the targeted interventions, we had a significant role to play in terms of helping NACO write up the guidelines. And that was one means of sharing our own tools, knowledge, methodologies on the ground with the government. So that's how the adoption happened. This is just to sure, thank you. Uh, this is just to let you know that, you know, post transition, I mean a lot of people ask that, I mean you had significant staff either through the Gates Foundation or through the grantees to see the transition through, but after transition worked, right? So this is where you know I cannot underscore the significance or the importance of having what we call as the technical support units, right? So these are funded typically by donors. So uh, as a Gates Foundation, we fund two TSUs in the southern states. USAID has many other states right now, roughly around eight or more uh, TSUs in India. And we also fund the National Technical Support Unit, which works very closely with NACO. So this is like a quasi-government you know, government body. I mean, these are professionals hired by donors like us, but they are sort of embedded in the government system. So on a regular basis, they are working very closely with the government to ensure that <coughs> there is rigorous monitoring and evaluation of these various targeted interventions, right? So they are sort of, you know, they, they ensure that NACO is able to keep the eye on the ball as far as quality is concerned. So very quickly, the graphs show that your key indicators did not drop post-transition. And this is a favorite slide because it shows significant the impact slides uh, across the four southern states. Um, and most of you, I'm assuming, you would have read the Lancet article which says that approximately 600 infections averted uh, through the Alahan program. 600,000, 600, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I'll just pause here. I mean, these are fairly self-explanatory. I'm also running behind time. So um, there are many lessons learned, obviously. So if you broadly classify the lessons learned from phase one, it's not all, but the significant learnings. So I, sorry, okay, uh, TI is this targeted intervention. So this is the basic unit of, uh, you know, the service delivery, right? So the key populations that you're serving is targeted intervention. Here, I just want to allude to the last point that, you know, what sets apart Avahan even within the um, foundation is the fact that uh, unlike many other programs where you would have program officers making grants out of Seattle and managing grants from there and, you know, maybe yearly check-ins uh, to meet with the grantees and look at what's happening in the field. The fact that, you know, it was a very conscious decision on part of the then country director, Ashok Alexander, to insist that he wanted a team to be based in India. And we actually had program officers like me, not even based in Delhi. I was based in Hyderabad. I had counterparts in Mumbai and Karnataka. And on a almost daily basis, we were dealing with our, you know, the state AIDS control society. So that quality of relationship management, I think, really helped uh, an efficient transition process. Um, again, these are the lessons from the phase two of our program. One needs to plan for it up front. You can't do it as you're sort of, you know, coming closer to the transition timeline. Um, obviously, it requires funding, right? So. While we started off with 258 million in phase one, we actually required an additional 100 million for the actual transition process to happen. Right, so it's not something that you cannot you can do without funding. Um, again, here I just want to highlight point number six is that, and I think it's very relevant for today as we speak in a environment where is where you have funding constraints. I think donors still have a role to play because. How you stay engaged uh, is very important. So you don't necessarily need big monies, 
um, you can be a thought partner to the government also, right? So that's important. Um, very quickly, maybe we can come back to this even later. Currently, the phase three of the program, if I can summarize it this way, uh, so broadly, you know, one can look at four risks that the key populations face. So when you talk about the biomedical risk, <coughs> it comes under the go government remit, right? So that box that you see, it's part of the government-funded TI systems. But where we feel that, you know, the transition to communities is still work in progress or it's unfinished business is that <coughs> when you're talking about those boxes, issues in service delivery, structural barriers, the other economic and financial vulnerabilities. It's more a social, cultural, behavioral change, right? And it, it takes more than a decade to work on those issues. So that's what we are focusing on. And these are the five broad themes, right? So when I talk about advocacy for service delivery, how do you ensure that you're capacitating the communities to have a voice, right? And, and it's not necessary. Uh, most people assume that it's meant to be confrontational right, and antagonistic. It need not be that way. Our whole agenda is to, you know, if one can call it intelligent activism, how do you arm the communities with data? How do they look for data? Who do they negotiate with, right? So today there are issues on the ground of, you know, one hears of commodity stockouts, whether it's ARV drugs, condoms, STI kits, etc. But do you get into a confrontation or do you have, you know, smart reporting systems where the community is able to collect data and take, into the, take it to the next level. And that's when you build credibility for yourself, right? So these are some of the elements that you're working on. If you look at the fourth bucket, the uh, financial inclusion piece, I mean, at least, I mean, I'm not an HIV expert. My experience is limited to what I know of Avahan. But if this is done well, it can be a game changer because, you know, at least theoreti theoretically speaking, you know, what keeps a woman in sex work is that she's in constant debt. Right, so, I mean, if you go to a state like Andhra Pradesh, every sex worker has taken loans from three different money lenders, sometimes at 100% interest rates, right? So she can never pay that off. So for the next 20, 30 years, she has to be in sex work. And there's absolutely no understanding around savings, how to get bank accounts, right? So we're talking about <coughs> very fundamental issues when you're talking about financial inclusion here. And just given the current environment where the government is very keen on pushing the, what is called as the Jandhan Yojana, right? It's about opening bank accounts, getting more people to save. It also resonates with, with what the government wants to do, right? Um, I won't spend too much time on this, except to say that, you know, we see a lot of merit in sharing what we have learned from the more than decade long Avahan experience now. So we have already been through a very intense one-year learning kind of a project with the northern states, right? So interestingly, if you see these uh, HIV surveillance data, HIV is stabilizing and declining in the southern states, and it contributes to only, say, around 31% <coughs> of the overall emerging new HIV infections, whereas the earlier, you know, what was assumed to be the low prevalence states in the north is where you see an emerging epidemic. So we see a lot of value in sharing lessons within India, to the northern states and of course Africa is, I mean maybe we can talk about it later Lisa, but I just want to say that just based on you know initial landscaping we see a lot of portability of Avahan's lessons in the context of at least the concentrated pockets of the epidemic and we already have a grant with the Kenyan government. It was meant to be a three years grant but again based on how things are progressing positively we just made a supplement and it's becoming a six year grant with Kenya. Um, Okay, so it wouldn't be appropriate if I don't talk about the current situation. So obviously it's not roses and daisies all the way. So while the transition process by itself worked very efficiently and we still continue to support the government, uh, the current environment, I'm sure you're hearing a lot of noise coming out of India, you know, various articles, is that overall there's been a budget cut, right? So especially social sector funding, which includes health, uh, it's seen a 30% cut in budgets roughly and obviously there's an implication on HIV right so if you look at the numbers there <coughs> for this particular financial year which is 2015-16 there's been a significant reduction from I don't know how much would that be in uh, US dollars uh, but it's a significant cut um, right and what complicates the situation is that this year 
we are moving to an arrangement where HIV used to be a centrally sponsored program, right? Entirely borne by uh, the central government. But just given the way we are organized, it's going to be a 50-50 kind of an arrangement. And probably in HIV, it's a 60-40, where the central government will spend 60% and the states are expected to pitch in with 40%, right? So that complicates things more. And of course, um, NACO was run like a vertical program, right? It had its own identity. It had a secretary level person heading it. So it had you know, a lot of push. Um, in the last year, it's got subsumed under the Ministry of Health, right? So that's the other implication on the HIV program. And obviously, I mean, India is seen as a middle income country now, and a lot of donors are also stepping off, including the Gates Foundation. So it's like a double whammy, things <coughs> like this. And this is just to show you visually that, you know, while the overall outlay went up from the earlier phase of the National AIDS Control Program, the phase three, to phase four, but in terms of the actual allocation, it has gone down significantly. Right. So, yeah, with that, I've overstepped my time. <coughs> um, no, you're allowed. I think everybody's very interested in hearing the details. And thanks very much, Atagi, because I think you set just a great context for the rest of the discussion. And you know, I would just say three, three things actually really struck me in your presentation. The first was how deliberate the foundation was in its planning starting around 2006. The second, that it was a relatively low cost investment to plan for the transition, although it was very labor intensive. Um, and, and the other slide that I thought was very interesting was the quality slide. Um, and it would be interesting to come back and maybe talk a little bit sure. more about that, but that there didn't seem to be a compromise in quality as the transition happened. Um, and I should probably also say up front that I actually worked at the foundation when Abahan was getting launched and was involved in some of the early conversations. I don't think that's biased me as a moderator today, but it's really, <laughs> it's quite incredible to hear how, how this has evolved from the original vision to, to where it is today. So, um, so with that, should we go now to the, um, the message from um, Dr. Uh, Dringa? And again, Dr. Dringa is the um, Deputy uh, Director of NACO. A very good morning to all of you. <coughs> At the outset, I would like to thank uh, John Hopkins School of uh, Public Health for inviting me to talk on this topic of transition from AHAN to NACO, that's National Aid Control Organization, Government of India program. I'm really, at the outset, I'd like to apologize that I could not myself make it because of some ill health. But nowadays, technology makes it easier to send our messages across the countries. I'll take a few minutes before I go really into the transition aspect to tell you about how the HIV program in India is. If you all recollect, during the early 2000s, there were many estimates given about the HIV in India. At that time, India was uh, estimate given was around 5 million cases would be there in India, which really disturbed all the country people and steps were taken to expedite the national intervention programs. It is at this time, in the year 2003, BMGF came up with the support to the National AIDS Control Organization in the name of Avahan program. The Avahan concentrated mainly in the four southern states and two northeastern states. And during those period time, these four, north, four southern and two northeastern states were accounting for majority of HIV in the India. The four northeastern states included Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu. And in the northeastern states, it was Manipur and Nagaland. There is a distinct about the spread of HIV in these four, in these six states. The southern states were mainly driven by sex work, while the northeastern states were mainly driven by injecting drug use. In the in these six states, Awan put up nearly 119 uh, uh, targeted interventions, and at that time, the government program was picking up and the targeted interventions were being placed in the country. The targeted intervention included all over across the country. And in the year 2007, we had around 799 interventions. And that was the beginning of nationalist control phase three. 
from 2007 onwards to 2012, there was a big upsurge in the target interventions all across the country. In the year 2003 to 2009, Awan interventions, about 190 targeted interventions were placed in these six states. The interventions mainly dealt with looking, reaching out to the high risk groups or most at risk population of sex workers, MSM, injecting drug users, transgenders, also looking to the migrants and the truckers. The main thrust of the programs were to reach out to the population and to sensitize them about HIV, prevention of HIV, to make them services available like look, uh, going to clinical access for STI, getting tested for HIV, and also trying to create an enabling environment so that the interventions can be adopted. Till 2009, these interventions were going on. And in the year 2009, the memorandum of understanding with BMGF was approached again. And it was decided that these interventions will be transitioned to the government of India through state state control societies. There were 190 interventions, and it was that year one will have 10%, year two, 20%, and the year three, all 70%. That means it was decided by 2012, all 190 interventions will be taken over by the program. The first 10%, which included nearly around 20 interventions, were mostly for in the, in the southern states. We set up a process of how transition needs to take place. First is, we decided the parameters or the indicators on which each of this intervention will be independently assessed. And this included around 34 indicators, which included the coverage of the high-risk groups or most at-risk population, condom distribution, condom utilization, access to services, testing, treatment, and also how the enabling factors have been done in these areas. Also at the same time, certain administrative issues were also looked into. The administrative issues included the interventions, how many people, like for example, how many peer educators to higher risk groups. The program said one is to 60, but in VMGF, at many places, there were much more in numbers. So when this transition happened, all these things were brought to fore. And at that time, everything was to be brought to the national program outline. So these interventions, which were there, were independently evaluated. The independent evaluation evaluators included experts, included community group members, and at the same time, also involved state state control societies and the NAPO official also. When these process were set in, each of the multi-stakeholders meetings were held and each was convinced about the advantages and how the donor funded or Awan project needs to be transitioned to the government of India in the long term. This first phase of intervention was a little bit tricky because number one, the financing knobs of the BMGF were a little different than the government knobs. Number two, the administrative setup which included the peer educators, the outreach workers, and the TI staff were a little bit different from the program. Also, the BMGF Awan programs, the testing was not that much as it should have been in the national program. These things were discussed, and all these things were sorted out in the transition. So in the first phase, around 17 interventions were transitioned to the program. This first tranche helped us to resolve many issues with the state, with the community, and try to bring them on board, on the on board in the interventions. The second intervention, which was around 20%, consisting of around 34 TIs, was much smoother. And this all was in the southern states. The northeastern states were not taken for transition either in the first or the second phase. In the third phase, most of the transition from the southern states happened. But from northeastern states, which was mainly the epidemic which was driven by injecting drug use, there were a lot of differences and the performance was not to that. And this is not because of the interventions, because of the geopolitical 
area of the northeast that's why they were there so anyway by 2013 the complete transition took place what i would like to emphasize is it did not mean only transition it also meant a continuation of post-transition support for nearly one year. The post-transition support included the sensitization of the NGOs to the national program. Because the national program, a little bit more stringent, less flexible, and also more monitoring and more supervisory. So those were a little bit in which the likelihood of community being not, uh, not being uh, happy was also sensitized. And this, they took it very well. And if one looks back, all these 200 interventions which were taken up, all have been working well. Until now, there has not been any drop in the quality of the performance of these centers. To the extent when 2012 estimates for HIV were made in India, 57% reduction in new cases happened and 35% reduction in the mortality due to HIV happened. And this is largely attributable to the program success in the northeastern states and in the southern state major. So this is what happens is, I would definitely like to convey to you certain aspects in this transition. Number one, the transition requires a transparency between the donor, between the government, between the state state control societies, and also between the various stakeholders that are there. Last but not the least, the community, the NGOs, which are in uh, which are implementing these have to be taken on board and the clear playing ground has to be set. There were issues like we had problems initially in the first phase where there were issues between the Awan interventions and the national interventions. But by, re by reconciling, realigning the, uh, the Awan projects to the national program, it happened smoothly. The aspects that need to be kept in mind is First is that one should be politically clear that transition has to happen. Like I said, in 2009, we changed the MOU and set up the targets for 10, 20, and, 30, uh, and 70 percent transition. This involved sensitizing each player in this game, in which Awan as well as the government of India played a crucial role. Once these people are sensitized, then the transition becomes much easier. Another aspect is that we have to convince all the stakeholders that donor funding is not going to go on a million times. And that's exactly what was done. Also, we also took into consideration while evaluating these interventions, any good aspects that were there needs to be absorbed in the national programs. Examples are, all our one projects had very good involvement of the communities and the communities were responsive to whatever we said. So that was one aspect that we took into our interventions and then we said we will go ahead and we included in all national programs those, those areas of community mobilizations. Within our, the national TIs, certain fundings were given so that community mobilization and enabling factors can be done. Another important aspect that we need to see is that the way it has to be done, the way the transition has to be done, it has to be transparent. We told all TIs about the indicators on the basis of which we will evaluate. Everybody knew about how it is done. And if any of these gaps were there, TIs were given time to come up and remove, rectify those gaps. I would say overall the transition of NGO interventions happened very smoothly and to the extent that at no place did we allow any of the interventions quality go down or in any way let HIV go up in all these areas which have been transitioned to us. This is how transition worked in India. I would also like to say something more. Though in the MOU with Awan and BMGF, we did transition these aspects of direct implementation that was through NGO, but somehow there were other non-direct technical support which was given. For example, the monitoring and evaluation tools, the training cap capacity building manuals and models that were there, all those also were taken into and imbibed by the program. Other thing that happened is the other support which was being given, like the technical support units which were given through our one, 
were continued in the national program. But at the same time, there was certain support which was being given by R1, for example, the condoned technical support groups. Those were not clearly outlined for transition, but now are being transitioned. At the last, what I would like to say is, if one has to do a large scale donor implementation program, one should be fully clear that this donor has to transition at a given period of time. This period of this transition should be decided. The methodology should be clearly discussed with all the groups and the government should make a strong will to take up all these interventions which are costly. The program should also be able to take up the best of the aspects which the donor funded programs are done. This is how in India we have done. Besides BMGF, we also had USA direct interventions at the same time that we transitioned. All transition was complete in the year 2013. And now no more direct implementation is being done by any of the donor funds. All is being done by national program. And the national program has learned from all the donors and has imbibed all the best parts and incorporated in the national program. I think uh, uh, with this, I'd like to thank you all and especially I'd like to thank uh, the John Hopkins and BMGF for supporting this talk. Thank you. Good day. Great. So, thanks to Dr. Drenga, um, who, as you can tell, has been working very closely actually with Sarah and with the Abahan team um, for, for quite a while. Um, before we actually turn to Sarah next, let me just ask um, if there's any just clarifying questions that um, Matangi could help with, either just on her own. Um, presentation or any of the points Dr. Juenga made. Um, so any quick trial? Yeah, it, it, it might be a question for a discussion later also, but um, our partner AIDS Alliance India, um, of course, was a partner in, in the program. Um, and um, they've expressed concerns that with the diminishing role of, of the Gates Foundation and, uh, and in the context of the budget decrease in general for health, what, how, do, how would you assess the ongoing willingness and of the government to invest in uh, prevention uh, for key populations. Can I just maybe 30 seconds and then we can come back to it in the fuller discussion? No, this, this frankly is a concern for you know most of the implementation agencies and you know donors like us who have invested a lot of both money and time uh, in India but uh, what we hear from NACO is that prevention is not going in anywhere. It's still very much on the radar. So it is a concern, let me put it this way, that it is a concern, but it's not a catastrophe yet. So if, if the budgets are going down in a way, if you look at the numbers, it's like going back to the NACP3 budgets, so to speak, right? So, I mean, recently I was part of the World Bank Joint Implement Implementation Review Mission, and these were the questions that we raised as a mission to NACO, and uh, no, definitely they are considering things like you know, putting together a team which will look at optimizing the available budget to some of the critical areas. But the implications are clearly that, you know, there are certain areas one may need to step off. Right now, what those areas are, maybe there's still, uh, you know, one doesn't have that clarity. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to wait and watch how things pan out. Any other clarifying questions? Um, so the transition from donors to, when we say government funding of TSUs, it's the bank funding, right? So in the case of BMGF, by next year, we would like to transition our two technical support units uh, in Karnataka and AP. And USAID has similar plans too, right? So over the last couple of years, you see the number of bank-funded TSUs have gone up. Right? So it's not government as in the domestic funding that looks at TSUs, but the bank puts in money for that. So there is a transition plan for the TSUs too. So let's turn to um, Sarah's presentation and then we can certainly come back to other um, questions. Um, so Sarah, you were asked by the foundation to do a comprehensive look at how the transition planning has worked and the execution of that. So maybe you can just say a little bit of background about the scope of work before you go into your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Lisa. And I'm, I'm acutely aware that there's probably a whole set of questions and comments that are bubbling here and we promised that we'd give you an opportunity to, to talk shortly, so I'll, I'll try to be fairly brief about this. Um, but we were invited by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation 
uh, back in 2009 uh, to conduct an assessment of the second phase of Abraham. And if you recall that, that these, this was the phase that was focused partly on the transition and partly also on the disseminate, dissemination of learnings. So there was a team at Johns Hopkins, and I put the names of the key players up there. Daniela was one of them, and also a colleague who couldn't be here today, uh, Sachi Azawa. And we were also working with a group called uh, Amaltash, which is a private for-profit consulting firm in, in Delhi, um, but led by Sunita Singh, and we worked with their, their team as well. Um, so I will focus very much on the, figure out, yep, uh, on the findings from the assessment today around the transition um, assessment. And I should say, in some ways, it was a real privilege to be able to work on this, because I think through this series, we've been hearing about a series of donor transitions that have taken place. But it's very rare that you actually have the opportunity to conduct an evaluation as that transition is occurring. By and large, people have gone back five years later or one year later to sort of try and understand what had happened. But we were able to, to do the assessment alongside the actual transition process. I'm going to speak very briefly around methods, just to give you an idea of how we approach this. Most of the presentation is around findings. I'm focusing really on three things here. Um, one, how was the, in, the transition strategy implemented and what effects did it seem to have? Secondly, to what extent were key elements of the Avahan program institutionalized after transition in terms of the kinds of practices being adopted uh, on, on a routine basis? And thirdly, what do we know about the, uh, whether or not program effects were sustained? And I'll conclude with some final lessons and, and reflections. <coughs> um, so starting on the uh, transition assessment methods. Um, this was uh, the goal of the uh, uh, assessment that we were asked to do, to generate practical lessons from evaluating the second phase of Abraham. Um, obviously, this is focusing this discussion primarily on this process of transitioning to local ownership. But the idea was that this assessment would both guide the transition process as it went along, as well as deriving transferable lessons for, for other processes elsewhere. So we did have a process whereby we were feeding back um, findings from the first round of assessment to the actors in country to sort of suggest what seemed to be working well and, and what was going less well. Um, we started out with a sort of conceptual framework uh, which got guided the assessment. It was a very simple <coughs> uh, uh, almost logic to this. We said, well, there's a series of activities that the Avahan Initiative as a whole is engaging in to support transition. Those are meant to lead to a state of transition preparedness. And we identified different elements of that in terms of um, the NGOs, government being capacitated to take over the program, in terms of there being effective communication around what the transition was, as well as alignment of, pro of the program. And that then, after the transition had actually occurred, um, the features, the key features of the Abraham program would be institutionalized within the, the government system. And this, in turn, would lead to a sustained HIV uh, prevention response. And then our questions for the assessment spoke very directly to this. What was the transition strategy, and was it implemented as planned? How well prepared were the TIs for the transition at the time the transition took place? TIs is targeted interventions. It's that acronym of the individual programs. How well institutionalized was the program? Were the program effects sustained? And the sort of overarching question, whoops, which was uh, what, are, what, are, what are the overall elements of a successful transition? Um, we used a mixed methods design. Uh, in particular, we relied on a series of surveys of individual uh, targeted intervention programs, as well as a series of case studies. And then we supplemented that with document review, secondary data analysis, and tried to synthesize between those different sources. Sorry, sometimes this clicker seems to work, and sometimes it doesn't seem to work. So. The keyboard might work better. Oh, OK. Uh, I did want to point out that one of the limitations for the overall assessment was really um, fairly limited buy-in from the government of India. As you heard Dr. Dingra saying there, um, there was a big USA transition going on at the same time, not quite as large as Abraham. And they were a bit curious as to, well, you, why are you doing this big transition assessment? Um, USAID is just transitioning, and you know there's not a big evaluation going on around that. So why do you need one? So um, there was interest, but not an awful lot of engagement. And that constrained us in a variety of ways. Um, in terms of the transition readiness and institutionalization um, surveys, these were conducted firstly just before transition. 
that was the transition readiness, and then approximately one year after the transition had taken place. Um, and we conducted them only for the second and third tranches. We came in too late in the process to look at the first uh, round. Um, we did, these were a combination of uh, structured surveys, which were targeted at the managers of the programs, uh, and then there was also some open-ended uh, uh, questions. So, you know, they would give us a yes, no, or kind of answer, and then they would explain it as well. Um, for the transition readiness survey that was conducted just before transition, we um, did a census of all of the TIs that targeted in the second round, and then we sampled from the third round, and there was 80 in total. Um, we tried to go back to exactly the same TIs um, for the uh, follow-up, the institutionalization survey, but as I'll explain later, there was quite a lot of lumping and splitting going on. So some TIs got split up into more than one uh, to respond to government guidelines. Sometimes TIs were merged. So it was actually difficult to trace them all. And we ended up with a slightly smaller sample for the institutionalization survey. For the case studies, um, we did longitudinal case studies of 16 TIs. And we selected them to try and get a lot of variation across states, across key populations. And we did these about six months after they had transitioned. So whilst the, the memory of transition was still fresh in their mind, they also had some experience of, of what it was like working in the new environment. It was really like a sort of 360 degree set of in, uh, interviews, talking to the managers, talking to focus group discussions with the key populations, and then interviews with the state level people as well around, about these specific TIs. Um, and then we also revisited um, a subsample of them, five TIs, one to three years later. So we had snapshots of what went on just after transition, six months after, and then where they were at, um, you know, uh, one to one to three years later. So the first sort of part of the findings is really around what was the transition strategy and how was it implemented. And these were the main components of the transition strategy, which were fairly consistently reflected. It was to do with strengthening government systems, both at the national level, state level, and, and local level. And I think you've heard quite a lot of that already described, both by Matangi and Dr. Dingra. It was also to do with building capacity amongst the NGOs and the community-based organizations that were actually responsible for running the TIs. And at the same time, and I think in the end, this took up an awful lot of effort, aligning both clinical and non-clinical aspects of the programs with government systems and government norms as well as enhancing key populations' capacity to demand access to services and, and, and information. And, and finally, and uh, uh, not insignificantly, around promoting government commitment to, to, uh, to targeted uh, prevention programs. Um, I would note, however, that this transition strategy was continuously evolving. So if you look at the sort of 2007 documents that articulate what the transition strategy was, and then look at more recent documents, you'll find there's different elements and different emphases. So it had to adapt over time. Um, the elements that I'm going to focus on most in this presentation are around these uh, three central uh, elements. So our focus for the evaluation was primarily at the TI level. We did also do some work around point five here in terms of looking at government's overall commitment uh, to transitioning and to um, retaining the focus on targeted prevention programs. But most of what I'm going to speak about today is around the transition of the TI programs, uh, what went on in terms of capacity building, alignment, and um, enhancing key populations capacity. Um, I wanted to start out with an overview, and I think you've heard this already, but in our view, the first tranche that took place in 2009, the small tranche, was problematic for a number of reasons. It happened in a really short time frame. Often preparations for the transition that occurred in April only began around sort of January. They were often still negotiating which TIs would, would transition just a few months before the transition took place. There was a lack of collaboration between the government and the other hand actors. Sometimes quite a lot of mistrust between those two actors in terms of you know what their intentions were and what they were trying to do. And then there were substantial delays after the transition took place in terms of getting new contracts set up, getting funding and supplies flowing. And there was limited post-transition support. I think often Avahan and the state league partners had assumed that they'd be able to provide uh, uh, post-transition support. In practice, that wasn't always the case. One state said, we really don't want you messing anymore with, with these TIs that we are now running. The second tranche, actually, it was two years later. So there was a 24-month period for learning, reflection, and, and being able to, to move, improve things. 
It was a much improved round, but it was also a very small round. There was, it was only 20% of the total. We observed strengthened relationships between upper hand and government. There were transition manager posts created, both at the state lead partners and at the, on the other hand side. And there was a much longer period for preparation. They also recognized that there might likely be delays in terms of getting stocks and commodities moving, funding moving. And so buffer stocks were created. And, and there was a move towards clearer agreements around post-transition support. I think the big question in 2012 then was, well, 2011 was successful, but it was only you know, 34, something like that, uh, TIs that were transitioning. Are you going to be able to do this for the much larger numbers that were transitioning in 2012? Our sense again is that there was even earlier preparation, often starting about nine months before transition took place in terms of building the skills, aligning the systems, very strong collaborations at the state level by this point. And the process was guided by a common minimum package for transition. So it really is just a spreadsheet that lays out in quite a lot of detail what needs to be done on multiple different dimensions to allow transition to occur at the TI level. And the post-transition support agreements were institutionalized across all of the TIs, um, so very clear what kind of support uh, the, the upper hand team could, could provide afterwards. So I'm going to go into just a little bit more detail about these different <coughs> dimensions. Um, we were interested in capacity building and engagement. You know, to what extent was capacity really built in advance of the transition and were the NGOs prepared? We saw improved staff training on transition over time. Both TI managers and staff received more training in 2012 than they had received in, in 2011, although we did observe that that training continued to be focused more amongst the higher level staff than the lower level staff. Um, and we also noted that 2012, some of that training really came pretty late. There was also um, uh, a plan to involve staff within the TIs in, um, uh, in, in preparing for the transition and in pre preparing transition plans. That happened to varying degrees with big differences between states. Um, we looked at both clinical alignment and non-clinical, meaning sort of managerial, financial alignment. In terms of clinical alignment, um, largely what was going on was a, a shift in service delivery away from the services being provided within the TIs to much greater reliance on government systems and government health services for the provision of services. Um, and that meant that, by and large, providers were less regularly available and less easily accessible uh, to, the, to the key populations. But at the same time, there was quite a lot of sensitization work that went to, that took place on the government side, preparing the government systems to accept more of the key populations into, uh, into their um, into government clinics. And we heard that reflected from the key populations, that they felt that in terms of seeking care from government, there had been improvements in terms of stigma and, stigma and discrimination that had previously been felt. Um, However, the key populations also talked about a shift going on from you know, a, a, a model whereby Avahan TIs had provided fairly broad health services, support for STIs, to a, a system that was much more focused narrowly on HIV testing and, and referrals. Um, we found on the sort of specific indicators of clinical alignment, fairly high levels of clinical alignment across STI syndromic management guidelines, for example, which were different between Abraham and government, as well as referral rates to government um, integrated counselling and testing services. And I think that this chart reflects that. You know, these were the percentage of TIs in the 2011 round, 2012 round, which were fully aligned with government norms in these respects at, when we did the survey just before transition. And then as I'm about to move into the non-clinical alignment, these were the data coming from uh, on the non-clinical side. And you'll see that by and large, they were um, fairly uh, well aligned, the exception being really around procurement. And the explanation for that was, well, we was because of the buffer stocks, because they recognized that there might well be delays in terms of getting um, new contracts in place and getting commodities flowing through the government system. The Avahan team had built up buffer stocks for commodities, which meant that the, the TIs hadn't had to fully shift over to government procurement systems at the time that we did the, the surveys. Is this all making sense, more or less? I'm going fairly speedily, but um, maybe save questions for later, because otherwise I don't think we'll ever get through it. But, um, Non-clinical alignment. As I've already said, we saw high alignment of budgets, TI team structures, reporting systems, 
and many TIs described having to cut salaries, and some also cut staff. Some TIs also noted that the budgets, uh, the limitations on budget, had meant that they had to cut trainings, meeting, traveler allowances, outreach, office expenditures. Um, although there were substantial cuts being made, I would say that from the program managers, manager's perspective, by and large, these weren't disastrous. They were manageable, they were uncomfortable, but manageable. The other thing which I'd already alluded to was at the time of transition, there was quite a lot of splitting and merging of TIs going on, and that really um, contributed to the stress of the process. The other hand, TIs would often have um, uh, men who have sex with men along with commercial sex workers in the same TI group. Often they were split out at the time of transition, and also there were changes to TIs just to make sure that they were more standardized in terms of the numbers of key populations that they were, 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 covering, were covering. I think the other big set of issues that arose in terms of uh, non-clinical aspects of alignment was around peer educators and their role post-transition. Um, travel allowances were reduced or, or frozen post-transition. That made it harder for the peer educators to get around the districts. There was also an increase in the, peer, the number of KPs that peer educators were meant to be um, serving almost everywhere, although some state league partners managed to negotiate some exceptions there. And there are also new literacy requirements on the government side, which basically required literacy amongst peer educators, which Abraham hadn't required. It seems like a small detail, but it obviously had quite significant implications in terms of program management. The final element that we looked at in terms of transition readiness was around enhancing key populations of capacity. Um, and I would say overall, the perspectives that we got from, transition, from the um, uh, targeted intervention program managers was rosier than the feedback that we got from the uh, community uh, members. Community members expressed more negative views about the effect <coughs> of transition on community mobilization and outreach. And they felt overall that there had been a shift away from providing incentives and community recognition activities to a sort of more narrower focus on, on HIV AIDS prevention. So even small things like the discontinuation of funding for tea and refreshments it was you know, very small budget line, but it was taken away, um, or it, it was much more limited budget post-transition to accommodate this, and uh, the, the key populations were concerned about the discontinuation of, of, of these such services. Um, and I talked already a little bit about the shift in clinical services and the fact that there were some mixed feelings amongst the KPs around this. On the one hand, some felt that appreciative that they were being mainstreamed in government clinics. Um, but they also mourned the loss of general health services provided by the targeted interventions. Um, and I think it also played out very differently for different key population groups. The groups such as commercial sex workers who could blend in more easily in government clinics were less concerned about this than, for example, transgender groups. Um, in terms of the second question about how well institutionalized were the key features of Afghan <coughs> after transition, we went about doing addressing this question by using a Delphi technique, which is basically sort of circling around a group of uh, key informants to figure out what are the key elements of upper hand that you really want to persist after transition has taken place. Um, so we worked with a group of about 20 key informants, both um, BMGF staff, but also other partners within the upper hand program. And they identified a set of um, key features of Abraham that they thought were really critical that these persisted post Abraham. I've reflected them here and sort of also bundled them by a set of, uh, according to a set of management practices that people thought were key, extensive use of data, strong on site supervision, things like that. Um, around funding and supplies, they were very um, focused on the need for on time, adequate, and uninterrupted flow of funding. And then a set of roles around peer educator roles, which they felt were, were very important. <coughs> so in the institutionalization survey, we asked the managers of the targeted interventions about the extent to which these practices had continued and whether they had stayed the, the same or, or not. In terms of the management practices, what we found was that there was actually a significant amount of change had taken place in the programs in a very short space of time, in the sort of nine to 12 months after when we went back to, to do this survey. So you can see this here, both for the 2011 cohort and the 2012. So 60 to 75% of them saying, on this indicator, supervision has changed, 
But then what was surprising was that the large majority of them, and this applied for all elements of management with the exception of one, was that they felt things had changed for the better in the nine to 12 months after transition. And this was the explanation that they provided. Supervision is more regular. We have monthly video calls with the project director at SACS. Supervisors spend more time in the field. And while there were some negative views expressed, overwhelmingly the sense was that things have actually got better. The one exception in terms of management practices was that SACS <coughs> and the state aid control societies were less flexible than Abahan, which I didn't think was a surprising <coughs> finding. In in terms of um, institutionalization and funding and supplies and the extent to which there were um, uh, uninterrupted and adequate uh, funding and supplies, I think the picture here was more mixed. Um, close to 70% of the TI said that they normally had sufficient stocks of commodities. Um, they noted commodity stockouts, particularly for condoms. Uh, in terms of cash flow, 7 to 14 percent of the TIs across the different rounds said that they regularly <coughs> had problems with cash flows, um, and only 40 to 50 percent said that they have never had cash flow and problems. Although you could say that delays and disbursements were not extensive, you know, 15 days to, to one and a half months. I've already pointed out that the transition led to lower budgets and some of the, the consequences of that. The third element that we looked at in terms of institutionalization was around sort of peer educator roles. And again, I think you can see from this that there were quite substantial changes that occurred in terms of peer educator roles. But often people felt this was um, for the better. Um, this wasn't actually entirely true for training, where people said that you know, budgets for training had been reduced, although some thought that this had been compensated by the fact that training was actually better targeted now than it had been under. So the um, sort of third section of the results were to what extent ha were the sort of service coverage outcomes that um, were established under other hand sustained post-transition. And you've already seen some slides from the Tangi that address this. Um, we looked, and, and this data comes from the TIs that we surveyed, we looked at the percentage of um, high-risk groups co uh, uh, contacted per month by PEs. And as you can see, the picture is fairly same similar to what Matangi was suggesting, that there was not much change pre and post transition. We've actually combined the, the data from both the 2011 cohort and the 2012 cohort here. Um, and in terms of number of condoms distributed um, per HIG per month, again, fairly flat trend line. We're not seeing drop-offs in service coverage post transition. Although I would point out that you know our data only go up to nine to 12 months post transition. And I think that it would be very interesting to go back uh, now, that much later. Um, you'll have realized that we've had data around transition readiness, how well prepared the TIs were, the extent to which key Abahan practices were institutionalized af after, and what happened to service coverage. So we were interested in exploring the relationships between these. And I won't go into um, the technical detail, but just to say that in terms of the effects of transition readiness on service coverage, from the, the analysis that we've done, there seems to be a very significant effect in terms of those TIs that were better, better prepared at the time of transition um, ended up with better service coverage. Um, more, less easy to explain was the fact that institutionalization and our measures of institutionalization seem to be insignificant on all roles, so on all fronts. So uh, there's no uh, a linkage or, or correlation between the effect of transition readiness on institutionalization, and institutionalization doesn't appear to have affected our service coverage. Um, there's a number of different explanations. It could be that our tool capturing institutionalization just didn't do a very good job. But I think that we also felt that there was some conceptual dissonance there in the sense that, on the one hand, we're asking how well aligned are these TIs with government norms? And on the other hand, we're saying, well, we want you to align with government norms, but we also want you to adhere to some of the key features of other hand. So there's sort of tension there that um, I don't think we fully worked through on our own. I'd also point to the fact that it was clear that a lot changed immediately or, or quite, you know, quite shortly after the transition. There were a number of changes, but people saw them as being for the better rather than uh, uh, for the worse. So in terms of elements of a, a successful transition and a few final reflections, I think that the list of, um, sort of key elements that we've got actually reflect fairly closely the points that Matangi put up on, the, on her slides earlier. 
We think that the extended timeline and phase transition with transition discussions starting seven years prior to the final transition were actually critical in terms of making this effective. Uh, and the sort of significant period of learning, particularly between the first round and the second round when there were 24 months where they could reflect on what worked and what didn't work was also key. Um, very substantial investments in TIA preparation. We've talked about the transition managers, the um, clear budget lines to support the transition process, buffer stocks of condoms and supplies, post transition <coughs> support agreements, and the common minimum package for transition that really laid out what needed to happen for transition to be effective. In terms of commitment to transition, we haven't, I haven't talked much about it in this presentation. But we feel that Avahan was very fortunate in terms of being able to transition to a government that at the time expressed a very strong commitment both to the content of the program as well as to taking over the Avahan program post-transition. But I would also say that BMGF signaled fairly clearly up front that they were serious about transition. They signaled it through their memoranda of understanding with government and they also signaled it by in a way stumbling through that first transition round that wasn't very well prepared and everyone kind of knew that, but it was a signal that we're serious about this, we're gonna go ahead with it uh, almost in, in, in any case. Um, development of communication and trust. There was a lot of emphasis on communications. It was relatively strong. It clearly became stronger over time in terms of communication between the multiple different layers and the multiple different actors involved in Avaham. Um, and I think that this, the extended time frame also allowed um, uh, a development of trust over time. As I said, first round there was some mutual suspicion between actors uh, that evolved into collaborative working relationships. And finally, I think you know, both sides demonstrated an adapt uh, adaptability and a willingness to sort of work with challenges that came along and address them over time. Um, the initial strategy, for example, did not address community mobilization separately, as you've already heard have been significant amendments to the transition strategy to be able to take that one better. Um, so just final reflections. I think we came away with the sense that transition is a really dynamic process. You need to plan for it, but you also need to be prepared to adapt as you go um, forward. It creates adaptations both on the donor side as well as on the government side. I think there is one question here about which adaptations are acceptable to both partners. And I think, you know, if we had hindsight, we would have gone back to the beginning of the evaluation and said, you know, to Avahan and to government, what really matters to you in terms of what happens post-transition? What are the, the stakes in the ground that you, you know, really feel we need to hold on to post-transition? There's so many different moving parts to a program like this, and we were really trying to you know, track them all. Um, secondly, to acknowledge that transition, uh, that uh, programs may have multiple owners. I think Avahan invested a huge amount of energy in terms of ensuring an effective transition to government. Um, the community at part of this came in a little bit later, uh, but there may well be other owners uh, of a post-transition program. It would be worthwhile giving them more thought. Um, and then finally, and I think this is sort of very much a high-level overarching uh, uh, lesson, um, clearly transition presents risks to program sustainability. But I think, and I feel in many respects that the Avahan transition um, demonstrates this, there are also really significant uh, uh, potential for positive and empowering experiences on both sides. Okay, thank you very much. Sarah, thank you. And thanks for so much great information in such a condensed form. Um, and I, I certainly was struck just by the perception and reality issues, not only Avahan, the government, but also the communities that were being served, where, where their perceptions were sometimes different from the other yeah. two. Um, so I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll, we'll just hold on and clarifying questions. For Paul. <coughs> we're going to go right to Rob, and then we are still going to preserve some time for yeah. discussion <laughs> among the group. So, okay. So, Rob. Thanks very you, much. Hi, everybody. Rob, just do yep. say a word or two about the bigger set of work you're placing this in. That's, very that's part of what I was going to say. Yeah. I'm looking at the clock, and the clock is not my friend. So, um, let me see what I can do. I woke up this morning thinking about this, and my mind was working with the number four, and you'll understand why in a minute. Um, first thing I want to say of four is that I'm really happy to see this uh, event take place. Uh, the as, as uh, Lisa said in her opening remarks, this whole process of transition is so important and so hot right now in global health. 
And within global health, I don't think there's a bigger sub area than HIV because so much external financing through the Gates Foundation, through PEPFAR, through the Global Fund, through other sources has been going into supporting these programs. Um, and the ground is shifting. Uh, so how to achieve successful transition in HIV, I think is, is tremendously important. And within the series that we're doing, this uh, really stands out. And among the HIV transitions that I'm aware of, and I, I've been looking some at uh, what's going on in the PEPFAR world, and a little bit at the Global Fund, is, uh, uh, the, the Avahand experience really stands out. Um, I think in terms of its many positive features which you've been, which you've been hearing about over the last uh, hour and a half. So that's my first uh, remark. Secondly, uh, it occurs to me as we get into this question of transition and uh, country graduation, the move towards self-reliance away from external uh, support that uh, I've been in this uh, development business now for a few decades. Uh, as, as Lisa said, I worked at the World Bank for many, many years, and and at UNAIDS, I had a wonderful time at a at a at an exciting moment in the history of the AIDS AIDS movement and elsewhere. And it, it seems to me we spend an enormous amount of time designing things ex ante. We spend an enormous amount of time on entry, and we don't spend nearly enough time on exit. And as I get a little bit older, too, and I get a few gray hairs, I start to realize that maybe uh, exit is going to matter for me, too. I start thinking a little bit about uh, <laughs> finishing strong. And we, you were always focusing on starting strong and designing major programs. But those programs are, are ephemeral. They're not there forever. And especially when they're externally supported, there's the, the challenge of handing over. The, these countries' economies are growing. India's economy has been booming over the last decade. We hope that'll continue. Uh, and, and the government's capable of, of investing. The domestic resources are there the way they weren't uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And there's a shift in donor attitudes, if, if not uh, fiscal realities or some combination. So I just want to make a plea for all of us to be focusing on this question of exit and transition, because I think it's tremendously uh, important. And uh, we've been, in this series that Sarah and I have been co-hosting, we've been looking at a number of these examples of, uh, of these transition challenges, most of which are ongoing today. So they're, I hope you're all going to devote the rest of your careers to this, or at least the next 10 years, to this topic, because uh, I personally feel it's, it's very important and it's, I think it's uh, neglected. When we think about the Avahan transition, I just want to say that uh, my reflection today may change is that I think there are actually several different flavors of transitions going on. We, we presented the Gavi experience. We talked about family planning transitions in Latin America. We hope to be having a, a session a month or so from now uh, around the uh, polio eradication program and its transitions and uh, another one around the Ebola efforts in, uh, in West Africa and the way in which that's being transitioned or phased from one uh, uh, manifestation or one emanation to, to another. Um, but I think it's important that we start to see that these transitions are not all the same. Uh, not just that the diseases are different and the, and the countries are different, but I think the nature of the transition is different. So I want to put forward the idea that there are actually four different kinds of transitions going on here, and I'll put uh, uh, Avahan in the, in the third or fourth one. First of all, there are some transitions we've been, we've been looking at where it's really a question of transferring the financial and, uh, at least in the case of Gavi, the, the sort of narrow procurement responsibility for a particular part of a global health program. But it's already a program which is well nested within the national system, and that's the immunization uh, area and the, and the, the, the challenges of transferring uh, the, the uh, purchase and the delivery of new vaccines, like the pneumococcal vaccine and the rotavirus vaccine. And Gavi's been very vigorous and I think pretty disciplined, just like the Gates Foundation, in going about that process and also trying to learn and to adapt. I think there are a lot of similarities in the, in the way in which the transition's been handled, but it's, it, but it's a certain type of transition. These national immunization programs existed before Gavi showed up. These it, vaccines have always been within these national programs, and Gavi's responsibility has been relatively narrow. It's been around paying for subsidizing the cost of these new vaccines, seeing that they get out there, um, and, and so that's what's being transferred. So I think that's one type of 
transition. There also are transitions, if you read the literature, which I would call the indigenization um, of foreign programs or institutions to make them national programs or institutions. And there's a little bit of that in Avahan, I don't deny that. But I'm thinking really here of what we heard in family planning, where we really looked at the question of the IPPF affiliates the, in a lot of these countries that were getting uh, a lot of external support, financial, and even the management. And they were then, uh, when USAID pulled back in the, in the last decade or so, they became national programs, self-sufficient. Um, the, the, these national institutions or these institutions continued to exist, but the responsibility and the funding uh, moved from external to uh, internal. So I think that, and I, I think there's somebody here from PSI, right? I think the question of what's going on with the indigenization of your social marketing affiliates is, a, is exactly or very similar to what I'm talking about in the uh, family planning space. And, and the social marketing tra transitions are also a very interesting topic, which we haven't been able to take up. There also are the transitions that involve pretty much the phasing down or phasing out of programs, where it's really a question of cleanly exiting because the service isn't needed. And I don't know, I, in the case of polio and Ebola, certainly there's a need for continued surveillance and preparedness and, and, and kind of surge capacity preparation, but very different from an active disease control and eradication effort. So I think that's again kind of different from the transitions we're, we're talking about here. And then fourthly and lastly, there's the merging of large externally funded programs into big national or government programs. And that's the way I see Avahan. It, it was in the vanguard. It represented a, a significant, but not the, necessarily the majority share of the national prevention effort in India. But it was a big, a big play. And, and the idea was that the need to continue it, but to merge it into the national, into the national program and to do that smoothly in the way that uh, was described. And I think that's what PEPFAR is facing in many, many situations. In South Africa, where I do a lot of work, the PEPFAR program is huge, $500 million a year, but it's small compared to what the government is doing. A little bit like the, the India situation. The government's three times as large in terms of its financing and its effort. In some of the places where PEPFAR and the Global Fund dominate the national program, you're going to Mozambique or to Tanzania soon, I don't know. Um, the, it, it, the proportions are different, but still it's a question of the degree to which the, the externally financed efforts can be merged into the national program. So I think that's, I, I see that there are a number of different transition challenges or types. And uh, I just wanted to situate where I, where I see Avahan in that larger, uh, in that larger context. The uh, Avahan one maybe is similar to PEPFAR in some respects, but other, in others not, and I'm sure people here will have comments on this, so I'll try to also exit here so other people can, can, can comment soon. But I think that the Abahan one is especially, has been especially difficult, and therefore the successes are especially admirable, because the Abahan model of, of delivering these prevention services is a model that involves using NGOs. These are non-governmental, you talk about TIs, but TI is a code for a lot of NGOs. Um, these are not, for the most part, these are not, this is not public delivery of services. And so to get the government of India to take on the financing and the management of programs which really are NGO-led uh, in a situation where public institutions, public service delivery is competing for the same money and where in certain parts of India, NGOs are not always trusted or liked or whatever. There's some attitudes that the government can do it all. We don't need the NGOs or... They do their thing, we do our thing. So the, the challenge of, of, of transitioning financial responsibility and implementation to the national government in a situation where a lot of the delivery of these prevention services is NGO-based, I think is especially uh, admirable. And that makes it different from some of the transitions also where uh, it, the, the externally financed program really is also delivery through the public sector. So I just want to add that as a, as a special wrinkle. Finally. Um, I think maybe we should put back up your, your five main lessons or findings, but I just want to say that I, I found in Avahan four very positive features, and I just want to mention four very quick questions, and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, and they're pretty much covered here, but I just want to express them in a maybe slightly different language. The fact that the Gates Foundation and Avahan set a clear timeline and set it early and more or less stuck to it, 
I think is one of the key features of success. That's what I think has been successful in Gavi. Uh, when I looked at the family planning experience in Latin America, USAID was pretty resolute about having triggers and clear criteria for graduation and sticking to them, but with some amount of flexibility there. You, I think uh, maybe in 2003 when you set the timetable, you didn't think you'd necessarily still be involved the way you are today in 2015. Maybe you thought you'd be where you are today three or four or five years earlier. But the idea of being explicit early on, setting a, a process, and then more or less sticking to it while being somewhat flexible and, uh, and learning by doing. Secondly, starting and thinking through the transition process very early and investing in it. I think that's just tremendously important. It's very difficult to do, and uh, it can't be done at the last minute. And I think that's also an important uh, success feature here. Um, the challenges of this alignment are enormous. Um, you mentioned the alignment of the services, the alignment of the budgets, I guess, alignment of human resources in health, alignment of information systems and reporting systems. I don't know that you even it did full justice to the complexity of the alignment that needs to take place. But I, I think it's, it, in all cases, uh, it, it, it's, it's multidimensional, it's difficult to do, and it was done very well in, uh, in, in India by Avahan and by the government. Um, because we kept hearing the results of this fantastic evaluation and so on, we forget the fact that one of the special features of Avahan, which made it uh, successful, was that monitoring and evaluation were we're a, big, we're a big part of this process. And it's, and, and it's not a big part of the process in many other uh, cases we've looked at. And I think those investments came early and they were uh, carefully thought out and they made uh, an, enormous, an enormous difference. Having 34 indicators to see how the transition was going, uh, having Johns Hopkins and Al Almatas? The, your, Almatas, yeah. Yeah, your, your local uh, 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 colleagues in the evaluation space carry out the evaluation itself I think is a is a is a big plus here and then finally this whole business of um, trying to keep respectful distance from the government but being somewhat embedded and the close communication the technical support units which you mentioned I think probably in some ways they were very uh, really a key element of that integration or communication which maybe you mentioned but I would even bring out more of from what I saw in the states and what I saw in uh, in New Delhi, the technical support units were such an important way to get uh, Gates Foundation, Avahan thinking, and government thinking to come together. Uh, I think that was a very important instrument. Finally, um, just four, they're not criticisms, but just four things that I don't think have been fully answered. Um, I have to say this as an economist, um, sorry about that. It, it, I, I don't think the question of the sharing of the budget and finance information doesn't really come out of this story. It must be there, I'm sure. but I find it somewhat uh, hidden. Um, and even the question of whether there was any type of financial sustainability analysis done to think through the risks and the challenges that the government would face and how that was approached. That I feel that that is an area, certainly we see it in, in Gavi in a huge way. I know it's, it's, a, it's a preoccupation for, for uh, Mike Ruffner and for Janice and so on, for PEPFAR. And it, it's funny, you, there wasn't a lot of talk about doing financial sustainability analysis or, or sharing budget information, aligning budgets, um, but I know, I'm sure it was there. Secondly, you, you kind of say a lot of the expectations and the, and the plans were built into the MOUs and the, and, and the other agreements. It would be interesting, to, if, if it's possible, to actually open up those and talk more about those MOUs and those agreements. It seems to me that those are such critical documents. Um, and I don't know if they're confidential and they can never be shared with the rest of the world, but how that set of expectations and relationships is defined in these key documents. Um, certainly PEPFAR has tried to do this through these partnership framework implementation plans or are there some new, probably new iteration of them coming out now. Um, but I'm a big believer that some type of compact or contract which is written, which is sweated by both parties, which they both sign, and which is then used for the sort of monitoring and accountability is hugely important. And I think that part of the Avahan story uh, has not yet been fully told. And I don't know what's going on, on there, but I think it's important. Related to that, um, more discussion of what were the sort of monitoring and accountability processes that, that, that were done over the five, ten years of the, of the program and the transition. I think we could learn a lot more from, again, opening up that 
somewhat black box about how the monitoring and the, uh, all these data systems were set up, reporting, all kinds of targets, but not a lot of discussion about how they were actually used. Were there annual reviews, semi-annual reviews at state level, at national level? Did you, were there certain points along the way where the monitoring revealed the fact that things weren't going so well? How were the mid-course corrections made? I think when we talk about successful transition, it's not about how we design it, it's about how we implement it and how we adapt. That's what your, what your own story tells. And I think that bringing out more clearly how the monitoring and accountability was done. And then finally, um, to come back to my, to my previous point, this question of how the Avahan Gates uh, uh, group had policy dialogue with the government on this question of the role of NGOs in HIV prevention and HIV in general is something that uh, I'm curious about and maybe it, maybe it wasn't a major, a major point, but um, when we look at the transitions in some other countries, this issue of whether the government is willing to even consider using its own funding to support NGOs. A lot of the donor mode is to implement through NGO contracts and subcontracts. And if that's really efficient, if that's really the way to reach vulnerable populations, if that's really uh, the way to engage communities, um, then during the transition to move to a pure public sector delivery mode seems ill-advised. But it's difficult sometimes, to, not sometimes, it's often very difficult to convince governments that their own resources, their own domestic revenues, their own domestic budgets should be channeled through the same contracts and arrangements with NGOs. So I think trying to unpack that a bit uh, and how that's gone and whether some of the, I, I know that, that I was in India uh, during this transition period. We were asked by the Gates Foundation and the World Bank and NACO to look at the cost and financing options for NACP4 and I remember the additional secretary at the time um, was talking about uh, phasing out the TIs or she was saying they, they've been successful, why do we need to even continue them? This was, I'm sure you know, you know the story, Aradna Jory. And so the question of both the sustainability and whether behind that there was some attitude by the government that our, our scarce resources shouldn't necessarily be used for these NGOs was very much on the table. And yet to make this sustainable requires that, that I think that 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 approach of public, public finance and, and NGO delivery be, be, be respected and followed. So the question of how that has been handled and how that's going to go in the future, I think is tremendously important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. And, and yeah. just on that last point, I think the additional, at least point for me, is that you know, when we think about where it appears you know, the, the global community that works on HIV wants to go in the next several years, it's definitely towards very dramatic scale up of any number of interventions, but particularly treatment, and I think one of the things we've learned is that we're really going to have to do that if we deliver more of this critical services through the community and through NGOs. Yep. So I think the learnings from Avahan I think are particularly appropriate to how we think about strengthening that community um, dimension. Um, so thank you everyone <laughs> for your patience. Um, and Sarah, we can go an extra five or ten minutes if, if there's interest in the room. Yeah, maybe possible? it will pause and allow people to leave if they have to, but it would be great if people were willing to stay. Okay. Let's just maybe also take a bunch of questions. Yes, no, exactly. Yeah. So I think we'll take maybe three questions at a time. So raise your hand, just remind us again of who you are and where you're from. And if there's a particular person you want to direct it to, just say that as well. So why don't we start in the back there. So I'm Debbie Cleo, I'm from USA. Um, and one question I had was just, and I think uh, Robert is clarifying a little bit, the TI, um, and this is for Sarah, and maybe just not being as familiar with the program. It sounded like it was an intervention, but then maybe the reality is it's a like a community organization, a CSO, and so I just wanted some clarity on what you're assessing the readiness of. It's the readiness of this organization to take on the activity. So that was one question. And then um, broadly, when you talk about what you're evaluating, it sounds like you're evaluating the program and I think within USA, we're sort of shifting some, and maybe part two to think about not just sustaining a program, but sustaining the ultimate outcomes we're looking to achieve. And I think you know you had some um, data on some of those, like a little lower level outcomes, like number of condoms that were distributed and things like that. And it sounded like there was some data in the first presentation that looked at broader kind of HIV impact kind of outcomes. Um, so I wondered if if there was data available to look at that as part of your evaluation. I think, I know in our PEPFAR world, we're so focused on that more ultimate 
tasks versus you know how many people reached or, or the program sustainability. So I wondered if there was data to look at that and if that's something that was possible. And then the last question also for the first presentation, um, I just was interested in you now are going to this third phase where you're focusing on community. And I wondered what that really looked like um, and how that was um, just what that looks like, what's different, and, and is that a smaller kind of piece that would eventually phase off completely as well? And how would you transition that piece? Thank you. Three questions in one. So, <laughs> Janice, I think. Yeah, no, this is great. I mean, you're right. It's so rare we get to really get such an in depth look at and really well thought out and structured in terms of every information. <coughs> so, appreciate it. So, one thing I, I might have missed is is in the transition, and it gets back to your question, for, did the, the government increase its budget to take on the program? So the, just to clarify that. And then you, you, know, you touched on this on the question of political will and the importance of it. How was it manifested, particularly in a program that's addressing key pops and it gets to, you know, were there champions that made this happen? Uh, so put a little bit more depth on because that really gets to institutionalization, whether it's going to last as well. If you don't have your political will and your champions, um, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. the budgets would be cut. Yes, my colleague just said, yeah. So, how, so yeah, that gets to the longer term sustainability issues. So just a couple questions on that. And reading from you and um, just to sort of build on your point, Rob. There's this fear, I think, that government programs won't take on the condom, you know, programs, the ex syringe exchange, whatever. We see that in the U.S. and so the NGOs hold on tight. So this is a powerful proof of concept. But I'd be curious to hear more about how in the Obama program, you did you have legal issues? Did you have to, when you say you educated the government? What was the journey like to get them to be willing to do these things? <coughs> and was there a change in any kind of legal air cover or framework? Um, how did that? So why don't we just maybe go first then to this question around political will, okay, and what it sort of took, because I think the questions overlap a little bit, to, um, to, to actually get that kind of buy-in, build that kind of trust um, with the government, and then Janice, you also raised a practical question about budget increase. So uh, who would like to maybe address that first? I don't know, Matali or Sarah? We probably both have something to say. Okay, <laughs> so Sarah, why don't you start? Um, so the transition took place in the context of NACP3, the National AIDS Control Program 3, which envisaged large scaling up in any case of investment in targeted uh, prevention activities. So Avahan actually came on the scene a little bit too late to influence the overall shape of that policy, but the way that that policy then got implemented, I think, was heavily influenced by Avahan and some of the ideas that it was pushing. So in terms of the budget, when I said, you know, that Avahan was fortunate in terms of being able to transition into a receptive government that was in any case increasing significantly. I, I, I've got sort of two or threefold spending increase between an ACP2 and an ACP3 in my head. I'm looking around for support, but that's about right. So it was, it was a big increase in spending from government that was already committed to before Abraham then was transitioning. In terms of how that political will evolved, I mean, I'd be interested to hear from Harry and, and, and Matangi. Um, I mean, I think my sense is that there were multiple different actors, both on the donor side and on the government side, and very senior level government leadership for uh, a stronger HIV AIDS response at that time. So we're talking around mid-2000s, which was then the context that Abraham started transitioning into later. I think that there were some individual champions. I think some of them have now moved on and, and moved out, and I think that that's one of the challenges here. You know, you can build political will with a particular government and a particular set of actors, but there's no guarantee that they're going to be there five, ten years later. But Harry and Matangi, you've probably got more history on this than I have. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, uh, I, mean, I, I think uh, while this might have sounded a lot like you know, the foundation sat down with the government and discussed this, actually there was a lot more to it. I mean, uh, the World Bank, USAID, I mean, CDC, you know, were all very actively engaged in the design of NACP3. And I think what really worked well was, you know, the partners kind of uh, spoke they, they, in one voice, were of one mind. Uh, and uh, frankly, if, you know, the World Bank had wanted to block the design of NACP3, they could have, right? Uh, because, you know, they were the biggest donor and funder. Uh, but I think it's a fact that there was alignment at that level that, uh, you know, helped swing the deal with the government as well. Uh, the other part is, uh, 
the, the UNAIDS and uh, you know some of our partners uh, did a fair amount to mobilize you know number of uh, parliamentarians around this issue, uh, particularly from the states that were very uh, badly affected. And you know in that uh, mid 2000s period when there wasn't necessarily buy-in for working with sex workers and transgenders, I mean uh, you know homosexuality is still illegal in India, right? So. Uh, the support of those people was actually very critical. So, so we had a grant to uh, a domestic organization called the Heroes Project. Uh, UNAIDS worked to mobilize uh, you know, parliamentarians and legislators in several states. Uh, that level of support was actually very, very uh, useful and effective uh, to drive some of these financing discussions. And today, when you look at the you know the challenge for financing in general, you know, for health and other issues. I don't think those voices are as loud as they could be, even partly because you know people have kind of moved on to other issues or you know looking at other countries because now you know, India is not as much a uh, you know raging epidemic. So those are some of the issues that we have. Matangi, anything to add? No, I think I mean I just want to <coughs> echo what Hari has said, but uh, I think NACO at that point in time uh, played a significant role in terms of reining in you know the various donors. So. Like you see in you know various African countries right now, you have multiple donors, a lot of funding, but uh, in terms of having a one guideline, one reporting norm, and a single budget mm -hmm. that decides you know how interventions are run, mm -hmm. I think NACO played a very significant role. So, like Hari said, there used to be very strong partner coordination, and entirely convened by NACO, right? So, also in terms of a process. Uh, regular partner coordination meetings to ensure that there was no duplication of efforts happening, right? So one thing that we saw in some of our recent visits to, I mean, uh, without naming the countries, is that you know even some fundamental things like understanding what the den denominator ought to be, a size estimation, it's still not there despite programs running for you know many years. So I think NACO one needs to credit the role played by them. And like Sarah said, uh, thanks to you know good champions that we had at that point in time, right? So this one guideline, one budget, one reporting kind of a norm also helped sort of have some kind of a standardized approach to implementation. And then let's come to the questions um, from Deborah from uh, USAID um, that were sort of phrased around: Are we measuring program um, um, programs, or are we measuring, measuring outcomes? So what? Again, who? Any volunteers to? Right. Sarah, yeah, please. So I, I, you're right, Debbie, that um, it's CBOs and NGOs that are implementing the programs. And I think that actually our transition readiness measures was getting a little bit of both in the sense that the capacity measures are obviously related to the CBOs and the NGOs. The measures are of alignment or around the programs themselves. And to a certain extent, the organizations, because they were looking at you know staffing profiles and, and stuff like that. Um, and you had also asked about um, are there outcomes data available? So I think you know, Mutangi had some outcomes data, but what we have in her, her presentation, what we haven't got is specific to those um, upper hand TIs that then transitioned, and that would obviously be difficult to, to get. We're just at the noon hour, so we could probably do three more quick questions if people um, have them and have a few extra minutes to spare. Any other questions from anyone? I just want to comment on the outcome state. Actually, we continue to look at the data that comes out from the national surveillance, uh, which is done from specific sites, and also the data from the PPTCT program, uh, which both continue to show trends that are, you know, large, large. <coughs> I mean, there are secular declines occurring in this uh, southern state. So we do, do know that, you know, that's working. Thanks. Any other thoughts from anyone? Please. I just want to make a comment thinking about what Matangi was saying at the end about this shift now of it not being entirely a centrally funded program, but now being potentially 60-40, the state's taking on 60%. You know, I, that concerns me in the political will side and more concentrated epidemics, because we've seen in so many other places, I'm thinking in particular around Central and Latin America and the Caribbean, where there's not a lot of interest in funding interventions for people who are socially undesirable. And so um, states, where you don't, that aren't sensitized, where you don't have those kinds of champions, are happy to, happy to spend the money on treatment because it's some sort of obligation that they have to meet, but prevention is a much harder sell. Mm -hmm. And the, what limited budget they have starts going more and more and more to treatment and a lot less towards prevention, which sort of just is a vicious cycle. 
And I wonder if those efforts that were made in terms of building, by building that political will and commitment, how do you then translate that at the state level where you have where you have the greatest spending really actually happening and how much can how much influence can a central agency have, in particular as they're being subsumed into larger and larger bureaucracies to try to direct programs from afar? How do you want to take that? Yeah, so uh, I mean this is actually the the nub of the shift that is occurring in India, right? This whole notion of fiscal federalism, federalism is really playing out now. It's over the last couple of years that the center has started to move more money away from, you know, their coffers and tight central programs to, you know, just giving the states more resources for to let them program as they will. And frankly, there isn't as much capacity as you would need to be able to do that, uh, you know, in a very structured, rational way. So uh, this is, I mean, for, even for our maternal and child health work, for the work we do in nutrition, this is actually the central challenge that we will deal with. And what we have to do now is just work a lot more at the state level. Uh, the good part is, you know, you still have uh, the same set of bureaucrats, you know, people who shuffle between the center and the state. And a lot of them are, uh, you know, actually now quite welcoming of the greater autonomy that they'll have at the state level. So uh, it's going to go back to that, you know, finding the few champions. Uh, and, you know, these things are easier to do at the state level than nationally. Because you'll always find a few folks in some of these states, and because we picked the southern states where the HIV prevalence was the highest. People do have a historical recognition of this was a serious problem, this needs to be managed. People haven't, you know, declared victory and managed. I think it's going to be a bigger challenge in northern states that do not have a history of intervening seriously. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've been talking about restructuring some of our investments in this phase three, uh, you know, to increase support at the state level as they deal with this transition. Uh, but that's going to be an ongoing challenge for us. Thanks. Um all right, so I, I think just in recognition of the lunchtime hour, um, I will say thank you to everyone and try to wrap this up. I mean, one thing I would just share with people, Matangi and I had a really interesting conversation yesterday, and we haven't gotten to talk about it today, but about how the foundation is actively trying to bring the learnings from Abahan, particularly to Africa. Um, and, you know, if there was ever an interest in probably in having a follow-up conversation with Matangi about that, I mean, we'd be happy to organize it or maybe Sarah, I mean, I'm sure there'd be a way we could make it happen, even though you're in Delhi and many of us are here, but, you know, for me, looking at everything you've just presented, I think that's just such a fundamentally important set of connections to make that, at least from you and Aid's side, we'd be very happy to help with that. I'm um, happy to answer any questions because our grant in Kenya, it's like a proof of concept mm -hmm. in terms of what has worked, and it obviously meant taking along the other partners who are already there, right? Like, so, there are significant experiences to share, so it could be either through email or... So that's something, if there's interest, we can follow up afterwards. And then, Rob, just the other thing, for, for those who are here who would like to come to the future discussions in this series, you mentioned Ebola and you mentioned polio. Correct. Can, can you just use the sign-in sheet to sure. get Sure. If invitations? people left their email addresses, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. then we can, we can uh, put you on the list. Well, uh, we're hoping, but you probably are. Okay, we're hoping to. Yeah, if you came to this, you may okay, already be on it. Okay. But uh, uh, the we're hoping, but it's not confirmed that the polio event will be at the end of June, and the Ebola one maybe in July. Third week of July. We in July. So, and then we intend uh, in the fall to try to pull all this together and try to look at some of these cross-cutting and common threads, and, and produce something that will. No, Fra really frame this issue and also take on each of the specific examples that we've looked at in these events. So we hope you'll help us with that too, because we do think this is important. Yeah, it is. We think this. We think this is the. I think this is the future of development assistance for health. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Thank you.